<laughs> we'll call this meeting to order on the uh, January 19th, Knox County Audit Committee. And Kim, I believe you're on to help call the roll for us. That's correct. Mr. Morrison. Here. Mr. Warren. Here. Commissioner Jay. Here. Commissioner Beeler. Here. Commissioner Schoonmaker. Here. All five members are present. Great. Um, and uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Yes, I'm sure Commissioner Beeler has a flag somewhere behind him there. Okay. So uh, when we stand and, and we can face Richie's uh, <laughs> photograph there. So if everyone would stay, stand, give the proper salute. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, which stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you, Commissioner Beeler. Thank both of you all. Yes, sir. The uh, next item is, if I assume y'all have uh, seen the minutes of the last meeting, I think that was October 19th meeting. Um, do, uh, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve the meetings, Commissioner Beeler. Second, Commissioner Jay. All right, now that we've got a, a motion and, and a second, uh, I actually wanna have a short discussion here. I'm not sure where this falls into play but a couple of items and one in particular, when we elected the, uh, in our last meeting, we elected the chair of the audit committee, the co-chair, and then we elected the uh, secretary. And I can now say that I, in, back in March of 14, I, there was a resolution R-14-3-904 that when it replaced the section called composition, it did not include the secretary. Don't know that it really matters. And I'm still glad to have the commission <laughs> serve in that role. I just wanted to point that out. And then the only other item I have is um, Matt Warren, our other public member. We, um, particularly since he wasn't at the meeting, we elected him as co-chair. And Matt just wanted to ask if you're still, if you're willing to serve in that capacity. I am so willing. All right, thank you, sir. And that's all I've got for that. So uh, all, all in favor for approving the minutes, say aye. We need a roll call, I think, roll on call. item. Oh, we got a roll so, call everything. Okay, roll yes. call, please. Okay. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Morrison votes aye. Mr. Warren? Aye. Mr. Warren votes aye. Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoolmaker votes aye. All members present voting aye. Great. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the uh, presentation of the uh, internal school activity funds audit report. Uh, Ted, I assume you're heading that up. You've got the floor. All right. Thank you, Chair. Okay. You should have received. Uh, a copy of the huge uh, Knox County Internal Schools Funds uh, audit report, which is, uh, you know, nearly 400 pages. It's well over 300 pages. So I'm, I'm going to, I promise you, I'm not going over every page, uh, but there are some key sections that I do want to go over. Uh, I'm going to talk about the opinion. I'm going to talk about the, the dollars involved, and then I'll, we'll talk about the findings. So with that in mind, uh, also give you a little background, the school activity funds represent uh, receipts and disbursements that occur at the, individual, at the individual school level. So these do not include transactions from central office. Instead, they in include transactions at the individual schools through their checking account and then receipts that are collected by, by teachers and administrators at each school. So, so that's uh, what we are auditing here, uh, the transactions that are occurring at each school. And that includes uh, receipts, disbursements, ticket events. Uh, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of transactions. Uh, with that in mind, your, your audit report was on page uh, Roman numeral two through Roman numeral four. 
uh, and it's a unique report, but this is the report format that is required by the by the by the state of Tennessee, uh, because the report says the uh, the the numbers are not in compliance with with generally accepted accounting principles, but instead are in compliance with the Tennessee State Manual for internal score audits. So it is the standard report that you would expect to get. It's just uh, it's a little wordy and, and unique if, if you're not used to seeing the report. But it is uh, from from the school from uh, the state's perspective, it, it's a clean opinion report. Uh, then you you would flip forward to pages one through four, and the page numbers that I'm using are the page numbers that are actually our page numbers on the report as opposed to the PDF pages. Uh, so in the the bottom. Page one through four uh, are the finance, the summary financial su uh, statement numbers that include all the schools. Uh, on the balance sheet on page two, uh, the total cash held from in in all of these accounts at rough as approximately eleven point nine million, uh, and the total revenue from all these accounts uh, on page four is eighteen point four million. So. Uh, you know, again, a lot of very small transactions, but they amount to a lot of money, both from the standpoint of, of the dollars held uh, by, by the schools, uh, individual schools at the end of the year, or really at any point during the school year, and then certainly as far as the amount of money going in and out of the, uh, of the schools during the course of the year. Uh, so any questions so far? Yeah, can I just add, don't go backwards, but going forward, is there some way that somebody can share as you guys are referring to different, we have so many documents, so many pages within each document. Can somebody share a screen and kind of? Ted, I'll show that real quick for him. Okay, okay. very good. Thanks, Gary. We'll make sure we're all on the same page. Larson, or Commissioner Larson, if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead. I know you said not to go back, but if it's okay, I will just go ahead and, yep. and show everybody the pages just for reference and guidance. Gary, if you can start at page Roman numeral two. Okay, so can everybody see page two or there's page one. You said to the, two. Get to the, the opinion. Here you go, it's right here. Yes. So th this is the start of the actual opinion uh, and it goes two pages on the top of Roman numeral three is basically where it says uh, it's an adverse opinion on U.S. GAAP, but it's uh, a clean opinion um, down below on the state manual basis. So uh, again, it's a it's a clean opinion as far as the state is concerned. All right, then let's go to pages one and, and then two. Uh, here is basically the balance sheet that lists every single school, uh, and you'll notice the the checking and the savings total. 11 11,819,162, and then the, the savings account of 91,000. So, so roughly uh, 11.9 million of cash held between all of the checking accounts of the schools. And then on page uh, three starts the, the revenues and expenses ex or expenditures. Uh, and page four, you'll see the summary uh, that second column there is the 18.1 million, that's total revenues that flow through the schools. And then the column just to the right of that, the expenses were 16.5 16 basically. Uh, and the expenses were a little lower just because money comes in beginning of the year and then COVID hit uh, you know, three quarters of the way through the school year and, and that slowed some of the expenses that would happen at the end of the year did not occur. So uh, after this, uh, you have a couple pages that represent the footnotes to the report. That starts on page five here. And go ahead and uh, you can scroll through that. And then after these pages here, you'll start the individual balance sheets. Yeah, go ahead and stop there. Uh, like. Each school will have its own individual balance sheet and in individual income statement. And the first school's AL lots being the, uh, the, the first one in the alphabet elementary school. Uh, so 
Here's its balance sheet. And on the following page will be its income statement. So if you wanna see the details for, for each individual school, they're, they're in order, they're in alphabetical order. Uh, the elementary schools are first, the middle schools are next, the high schools are follow that. And then the few alternative schools that, that the school system has follows that. Uh, there are other reports after that, including information on interfund transfers and as well on uh, supplemental payments. Uh, but we, that's really for uh, even more information and, and I'm not gonna talk about them today. So let's go ahead and scroll forward then to the findings section, which is all the way to page 331. And Garrett got there very quickly. So um, the findings, um, we had 11 findings this year. We had uh, 11 findings last year. Most of the 10 of them are the same. One finding was significant a year ago where we had uh, issues with receipts where receipts were not there and it actually qualified the opinion for two schools. Uh, so that was a, a big deal in two, FY 2019. That matter has been resolved. So we did not have any issues where individual schools were were, had a qualified opinion. Uh, we added one, uh, that being negative fund balances, which we've had in the past. So, uh, but at least from a trade-off standpoint, one that needed to go away, one finding did go away. And yeah, this is the summary that's on page 342. Uh, let's go ahead and go through- Can I ask Ted, what, what happens? Uh, Chair Jim, I'm assuming you want to Sorry. go ahead and go through the findings. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Yes. Of what's the process after this? And you know, looking through the findings, there's some significant things. So, just tell me who the process of who takes this on to sort of rectify this going further. Is it totally left up to the school district, or do we, you know, have a role in that? Um, there, there is a corrective action that the schools have included in their report. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, has different facets to it because there is a corrective action and, uh, and, and Garrett, maybe you want to go ahead and point to that in the report, which, which follows uh, these, these pages here. I believe the corrective action starts on page, I don't have it right in front of me, uh, 343. So this, Commissioner Jay, this is the corrective action plan that basically the school's response to these findings. So you can, you can take a look at that. With, with this said, uh, while findings are significant, we also got to, you know, keep, you know, balance that out with uh, you know, the, the setup of these. Uh, you know, the, the amount of testing that we do, we're going to find issues, uh, particularly when you compound the fact that we're, you know, we test 2025 receipts or disbursements per school. That's 90 schools. That's a lot of transactions we're testing. Uh, the, the, the setup for these is that there's one bookkeeper per school and the bookkeeper has many different roles and, and you compound that for that there's a very high turnover rate and, and, relative, and a relatively low salary rate, rate involved. So uh, between all that, and then you factor in uh, you know, the, the latter part of this year, they dealt with COVID. So the findings were a little higher this year than, than past years. That, that's kind of some of the background of it. Uh, but let, let me pause for a second. And we want to talk about the individual findings and whether they increased or decreased from the prior year or which direction would you like to go? Uh, I, would, I would like to go over each finding and see if okay. there's any questions and uh, don't need a whole lot of statistics on it. And I think uh, Commissioner Jay is going to start to get the understanding of this, that there's a, while there's a lot of uh, issues with internal controls, uh, to, it looks like it here, and it is, there, there are a lot, but so oftentimes it comes down to the, the lack of personnel, bookkeeping, people moving in and out, and Garrett's worked with them a lot, and Garrett, was at our last meeting you spoke about the problem uh, of, of keeping people at the schools? Yeah, we have a significant turnover. This is Gary Raiden. Thank you, Commissioner and 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 uh, Chairman. 
there's a significant turnover in bookkeeping, uh, probably in the neighborhood of 70%. Um, when you factor in, and I, and I went ahead and I told everybody at the last meeting that I explained that 70% is not 70% of our bookkeepers leaving, but a change. Right? So from a standpoint of how you train a elementary bookkeeper that now moved to a high school bookkeeping job, there's a significant change in workload, right? Uh, athletics is now there, clubs are there, uh, you have a, probably double or triple the staff. So on our side of the table, when we're looking at that, we're going to look at that as a change, regardless if the bookkeeper left the system. Okay. So um, regardless though, it doesn't change the simple fact that someone left to vacate that position to begin with. Right. So yeah, we do have a significant amount of turnover in the bookkeeping positions. Um, it's also worth noting that their salaries are 18395 That's the starting salary for the position. Well, and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you a preview of my conclusion. And I've been, I've sat through three or four times this, this review three or four times, and I try to sit in on the school board's review of the same report. Um, and from, from what I'm used to, and I, I know Garrett and everybody that we're doing a lot of hard work on this, but it's, I just have trouble sort of accepting that we have this many internal control issues. And there's basically we're, the conclusion is, well, we're doing the best we can and there's not, we can't fix them all. And I think that's the expected conclusion. And I just wonder if there's some way to, I don't know, a better mousetrap or something in ways to assign duties or people's salaries or whatever it takes. But this is up to, you know, this, this goes all the way up in the schools that, that they're aware of this at the top. And at some point, I don't know when that is just their decision to, to let, let it operate this way torture Garrett with it every year. So, all right, I, I, so back to you, Ted. Okay. Um, the first finding back on was 331, uh, segregation of duties. Uh, this is actually one area that has improved. Uh, say improved. Uh, we have 47 schools that we consider there to be a segregation of duties issue. Uh, that's down, I mean, that's, yeah, that's down from 55 schools. It's actually down from about 80 if you go back about three years. So there is improvement, and this is, this is one area that, that Garrett has really focused on, so that at least um, there is basically two sets of eyes on, on every transaction, uh, and, and one person is not controlling a cycle. Uh, keep in mind, you know, that that's not easy to do, you can't do it just with accounting personnel because you have one bookkeeper uh, at, at a school, but it's utilizing other office personnel if you, if you have a big enough staff and it's using, uh, utilizing the principal as well to, to be able to achieve a, a better uh, internal control system and, and segregation of duties. So this is, again, this is an area that's improved. And then I'll, I'll go on to number two. Uh, Two is negative fund balances. And this is an area that is in the report most years. It actually wasn't in a, a year ago, but uh, there were four uh, cases this year. And that's where an individual fund has a negative balance. So you, if you take a look back at one of the balance sheets uh, for any of the schools, if, one of the, if one, any single line has a negative balance, then they would have considered to have a negative fund balance. And, and we had uh, four schools that had this, this issue hey, uh, this hey, past Ted, year. Hey, Ted, the uh, second sentence in that uh, second paragraph, the, this yeah. is a slight decrease from the seven schools that had a deficit fund balance in the prior year. Yeah. I thought they had zero last year. Uh, I th and I thought that's what you were saying. It went away last year. Or... It, it, it did go away. Uh, we, we had... I think there were there were just a couple that we had picked up last year. Uh, uh, the the state had a report that that showed seven, so we, we left that in there. Uh, but that there's a difference in 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 sub accounts, and that's what triggered the seven. Yeah, the state. If you don't mind, Ted, I'll uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so regarding that. 
the state looks at it from a slightly different vantage point, and that's why they've detected uh, sub accounts with negative fund balances. So if you have a primary account with three digits and a sub account with three digits, they were looking at a different set of data. So that's why it's not, sorry, not a different set of data, but they went farther in and looked at something a little bit more specific. They drilled deeper, yes. All right, thanks. So still, there, there's still a few uh, negative fund balances, uh, more, than, more than we would like. This is something I, I would actually like to see go away right. uh, because that, that's something that really is under, the con, under each school's control. But it's impacted by uh, you know, you know, turnover um, at, at a school and particularly towards the end of the year and then some, some cleanup or uh, does, doesn't occur that should occur. All right, let's go on to number three. All right, three is disbursements. Disbursements actually went down. Uh, we had 63 schools that had an issue with disbursements uh, compared to 70 a year, a year ago. Um, you can see in the condition section, what we consider to be an exception, uh, the, the six or seven bullet points there, six bullet points. So if there are any of those circumstances, thank you. Uh, any of those circumstances, then we consider an exception. Uh, now our number 70 versus 63, that is schools that had an issue. Um, you know, as far as total numbers, uh, we had 118 exceptions um, between, you know, how many items at all schools this, this past year, we had 127, so still down a little bit. Uh, in, in 2019. All right, but Ted, the, the fact that there's, uh, you, you got stuff without documentation that you either received it or you didn't have an invoice or, uh, you know, it, 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 if you were in somebody having to reimburse you for this, they tell you no, you know, so I realize where we are, but you're comfortable Correct. that at least the transaction may have happened according uh, properly, yeah. not documented, but and, and chairman, uh, and as well, other commissioners, you know, I'll, I'll cut through to what, what my summary is. Uh, I, I don't think we're ever going to have this finding go away. Uh, just as, as much testing, as much turnover as you have. But uh, I would like to see the number of exceptions to significantly go down. Um, because I, I, I do think the number of exceptions ideally should be a lot lower than than they are like again it, it's not going to go away uh it, it's just we do too much testing there's there's too many variables um go spend a day in in, in the office of of a school uh you know it, it's not going to go away but I, I would like to see it improve are we tracking on this Ted? are we tracking like year over year what are the schools and what are the uh, you know are, or do we have repeat violators and stuff i mean this is the kind of stuff that kind of gets to the heart of this, the stuff that gives me heartburn where it's are the schools good stewards of the money that is invested and is it being done in a way that in you know reinforces to the taxpayers that they're they're doing what they're supposed to be with it and when i see reports like this that says you know checks are handed out with one or none signature with no invoices and no you know no evidence that it was anything given out and it, it just like it just my head explodes. And so are we, you know, I know nothing's perfect, but are we going through and looking at it year over year and saying, okay, these six schools, we have the same issue over and over and over and over again, or is this sort of a broad stroke that even makes me more concerned that we're not even finding the stuff we ought to be finding. If this is a, if this is a quick look. I, I would say it's more than a quick look because we do uh, extensive testing um, and, and Garrett can probably answer you know, the evaluating school by school. I know it's done, but I'll let Garrett speak to that. Yeah, Commissioner Jay, um, Chairman, thank you guys for the question again. Great question. I'm glad you guys are asking them. Um, it's worth noting that I've followed this when I was an auditor with Pew, and then, then also now for this is going on my sixth year here. We I do track it every year, uh, so I know exactly what school had each finding and then how many of that finding each year. 
and then I can do a comparative analysis to see what, you know, what's trending and then not in a good way, by the way. And then, and then, and I take that to then do our training over the summer. So that is how I incorporate what the training topics will be, you know, based on how many findings we had in this area or that area. Um, but at the end of the day, Ted's not wrong. I mean, this is, you know, this is so much to do with a lot, lot larger picture, you know, um, I mean, just right now, probably before Christmas, I had seven bookkeepers out before Christmas. So, you know, there goes my segregation of duties because I'm filling in. Uh, there goes disbursement findings. There goes receipt findings, possibly. I mean, it's a domino effect of, of duties that are, are, are over. But specifically back on context, what we're looking at here, that one, two, three, four, fifth, fourth bullet, there's no evidence or documentation of goods or services. That shouldn't happen, period. That is, I don't know why that's happening. Like that, I don't know why a principal would think that they should just go ahead and pay something. And unfortunately, I, I mean, I know this is recorded, but I, I can't, I don't know what to say, what a principal is thinking to do that. Um, the, a few of the other ones I can, you know, blank checks. You know, everybody knows you don't write a blank check. That's just not smart to do, okay? Um, but unfortunately, I could validate that that actually is the only way some of our schools can actually make payments sometimes. Uh, and the reason being is this. A high school has a football game and needs uh, concessions and inventory, right? Well, Sam's doesn't currently have a way to know exactly what's in stock when you go and make the order online. It's called a click list or something like that, like Kroger has. Well, when they go get there to Sam's to pick up the order, four items may be not on the list. So now they have a check for... $140 and 12, 12 cents. That's now $122 and 82 cents and they can't use it. So the school is forced to write a blank check and have two administrators or an administrator and a teacher or two people go to the store and cash that check and bring back the inventory or the goods and or, and or services. The best part is there's a fix. It's called a credit card. <laughs> I thought y'all had, I thought y'all had those. Some of the schools had those. With, uh, so unfortunately we're still piloting it and it can only be piloted to the extent that I can basically monitor it. So basically what I've done and excuse my, I guess, arrogance here, but I've power tripped on the subject. I'm not going to give it out when I know it's going to fail. Right. So if I, if I know I can't monitor it, I'm not going to create something that's just going to set us up for failure. So in this case, I have, I have two staff now that work for me, Heidi and Angie and two people to monitor 88 schools credit cards where five of our high schools are spending, you know, one to $1.5 million a year. I, I, I'm not ready for that, but yes, you're right. Uh, Commissioner or Chairman Morrison, that is the, that is the answer to this. It's a risky one, but it also right. pays off because we get a rebate, right? So it pays for itself. It's a net zero balance. So, you know, for this specific topic we're on, sorry to go down rabbit holes, uh, commissioners and, and audit members, but, you know, there are ways to fix this, but at the end of the day, you, you, we have to be willing to take those steps. And, and honestly, the risk would be a reward on this topic. So. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question for Mr. Raiden. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, since you mentioned the blank checks, uh, how soon are those folks uh, getting back to the school um, to you know, actually say what was the check was written for? Is there a reconciliation pretty quickly? There is. Yes, sir. It's most of the time it's within a day, day and a half. So, you know, they're going after school on a, on a Tuesday and bringing the inventory back the next morning or the, that same day, you know, bookkeepers could go on their lunch break for all of them, you know? Um, but again, that doesn't, you know, if a bookkeeper is doing it, then now you have a segregation of duties problem because they're the one that signed the check possibly, um, so now you're leaving on an AD that really needs to be in the school, a teacher that really needs to be in the school teaching. So, so the direct answer is, I would say that it definitely is within a timely manner, at least generally speaking, you know, 90, the 90, 10 rule, 90% of the time it's done within a very effective and efficient manner. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, I can confirm that as well. It's still an exception. And we know it is one, but uh, but the turnaround time on approval has has been good. I, I just have one more quick question. I, we're not going to be able to have the time to go through every single one of these responses. I'm going to read them in detail myself. Is there something that the school system 
does besides just, you know, a response in, it seems like every response I'm seeing is sort of, yeah, we're understaffed in COVID. We're understaffed in COVID. We're understaffed in COVID. I mean, is there any kind of a narrative address that they, that the school system puts together to say, we've got some, we've got some improvements to make and here's what we're going to focus on next year. I mean, yes and no, that's part of what we do. Uh, so I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll answer that commissioner Jay. Um, so in layman's terms, yes, we, we do that. It, but uh, again, at the end of the day, it's almost impossible to make sure we know and know exactly what's going to be wrong the year coming up when we get the findings. No, 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 no. I, let me, sorry, let me rephrase. You yeah. get the findings, you understand it, you see where the deficiencies are. I think at some point the school system administration needs to go back to the school board or the commission or somebody, you know, in a comprehensive way and say, we know we have these findings. We know here are the things we're going to really work on to improve it. This is the kind of report that erodes the public trust in a, in a significant way. And it starts chipping away at the foundation where people say, gosh, what <laughs> you want more money? You can't even handle the stuff we give you. And so to me, it's, it seems all very reactionary. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there a precedence for the school system coming and saying, okay, you know, we, we, we understand some things are wrong, but here's how we're going to really work to make it better so that you have more trust in the fact that we're spending your money wisely and not just saying, oh, well, you know, we'll see what happens next year. I mean, that's the kind of, I guess, response I'm looking for. Yeah. And so just to respond to that, I, I don't know that I literally should be the one to respond to that uh, in my role here. I know that I can respond from my ethics and that, you know, when I took this role on and every year since this weighs very significantly on my job. I mean, I'm an ex auditor, so I exact, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. And I think that I, I show that in my role here on what I do, but I think for me to address your question, commissioner Jay, I don't, I don't know that I legally can. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. I'll take that up in another time. Sorry. I don't want to bog things down. We only have a couple hours here. No, I think it's a great question. I wish more people would ask it. So. And, and I will add to, to keep in mind, controls are different uh, in central office transactions with the schools than they are uh, at these individual school transactions. Uh, keep in mind, these are uh, funds basically that deal with class accounts, club accounts, special accounts, athletics, uh, those type events, uh, a, a lot of things that are collected uh, by, by, by teachers, for instance, or, or administrators at, at the school level. But still, you know, the, the dollar amounts are significant and, and, and I agree we'd like to see uh, an, an improvement on the controls over them. Okay, Ted, why don't you go through the rest of them a little quicker then, because I think okay. we're getting a handle on That's really what I wanted. Uh, okay. I will I say that- the Question real quick, just before we sure. leave this topic. Um, Ted, do you know, I know that there's six items listed there, and I know that the the, the response regarding the checks without two signatures was related to COVID. I, I get a full appreciation of that. Do you know in the other categories how many of those total exceptions there were by category or the, the magnitude of dollars that we're talking for by category? That, that were impacted by COVID? No, it's said another way, how many, you know, for blank checks, are, are we really talking a dozen exceptions from that and they were all concessions worth okay. $150 or something like that? Or were there significant differences in the ones that we were looking at? Uh, I would have to look that one up. I do know blank checks are used often uh, because of the scenario that, that Garrett laid out uh, earlier. Uh, I so... Do you have that in front of you, Garrett? I know I'm trying to pull it up and my computer's being slow. I'm sorry, but I do have that. And what I can do is uh, I, I don't want to invite myself to spend the night, so to speak. But at the next meeting, I can bring that to you if you'd like uh, or however you'd like me to get that to you. I, I think that'd be really helpful for the, the committee's understanding just to paint some color with it. So we know one, the the total dollars of disbursements that we're talking about for each of these by category, and then to how many times we're talking about it. Okay. Um, 
you know, I think if blank checks, I, I appreciate the that has to happen the way it is right now. I, I get that it's a control exception, but I want to make sure that it's truly all situations such as that. And there's not a, I'm using hyperbole here, but a $50,000 distribution that looks completely different than all the rest. So I have it up now. I'm sorry. So um, I have it up and it's, unfortunately it's, it's 2019 data, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's not 2020. So let the record show that I'm not stating 2020 data in this. I'm just using what I have readily available for conversation's sake. So 2019's data instances of dis disbursements, there was, give me a second. Looks like 57 made with no proper doc documentation. So I've, out of the entire gamut of 716 instances of findings in 2019, 57 were due to lack of support. So that fourth bullet. Does that help? So basically, I have this data, though. Uh, Mr. Warren, I have that for you. I can get that to you, though, okay? Okay, yeah, and that's fine. I don't want to bog us down with it today, but... Great I question. That I do track it. That just kind of leads into Commissioner Jay's conversation that I track it at that level, even though the auditors reported at the, the hierarchy level. Yeah, and if there's a way to show the aggregate dollar value as well, just for... That's harder. I don't have that readily available because okay. it involves other stuff, but I can get this to you, and at least it's a starting point. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, all right. Let, let me then just go go quickly through the other ones. I'm not going to, other than just to say how many instances and, and, and move on, then if we can stop at the end for any questions. Receipts uh, are, are up this year. Uh, 58 schools uh, had, had instances versus 47 the year before. Uh, in total cases, it's 78 for my tally versus 65 the year before. Purchase orders, number five, uh, were 65 this year versus 41 a year ago. This definitely is an area that got impacted by COVID. Uh, just controls were different once we, once March hit us. Uh, as far as total number of instances, 79 versus 51. 79 in the current year, 51 in 2019. Number six is ticket reconciliations, about the same six this year and five a year ago. Um, of course, this would only impact schools that, that have ticketed events, primarily um, middle school or high school. Um, then fundraising and resale activities. Um, we had 46 issues uh, this, year, this year, 31 the year before. Um, next is school support organizations, I believe, which um, really, uh, there. Th this is a matter of where there are 225 school support organizations um, that, that, that are known, but there are many others that are not known. And, and getting, getting all of them registered is an issue because school, uh, school support organizations are you know, using the school name uh, to, to support activities, but, but are not going through the right process. Uh, the, the next item, number eight, oh, excuse me, nine is approval of transfers. And we had 46 issues this year, 28 the year before. Keep in mind, a lot of this Garrett talked about earlier, uh, you know, his role had to interject uh, when, when we had people at home and, and transactions need to be, be approved and, and journal entries need to be made. Uh, and you had several bookkeepers out at the end of the school year. Uh, and then the, the next one, travel policy. This instance was, this was a big deal a couple of years ago. So this is an area where internal policies have helped uh, we went down from 16 to seven, uh, only seven cases this past year. 
And I want to say there were 25 or 30 the year before, or maybe even 40 the year before that. So this, this is an area where they instituted a new policy a couple of years ago, and it, and it is showing, it is, the benefits are, are have been seen. And, and finally, it's unclaimed property. There were 10 instances this year and 13 instances the year before, so a slight improvement. Uh, from, from my from how we labeled uh, exceptions, we had 449 total exceptions in, in all cases in 2020. We had 402 in 2019, so up. I do, you know, we did track, although I don't have that number readily available, we did track how many occurred in the COVID period and the percentage was, was a lot higher, um, really from, you know, early March to the end of June. Uh, I think it, without the COVID factor, we'd probably be pretty parallel to where we were a year ago in total findings. Um, I do think COVID is the reason why we've had a spike uh, compared for FY20 versus FY19. So with that said, any questions about any of the individual areas or, or anything in, in general? And yeah, I just put up the summary page. Okay, go ahead. I just wanna make a comment about the travel policy um, when I first got on audit committee back in 2016, that was a big deal. Um, and I guess what was interesting at that point, um, they had gone through a training program and yet they had just this multitude of uh, discrepancies in the travel policy. So obviously they've improved their training um, on this issue, obviously to see that they're down to just, would you say seven, seven. Uh, discrepancies? So, because before they were taking trips without approval, they were getting paid for, uh, you know, duplicate payments for, um, uh, for uh, expenses. And uh, I mean, it was kind of a mess. So it's good to see that they have made an, an improvement in travel. And of course, we can credit that all to uh, Garrett, I guess. <laughs> and Rob and Lane. Yeah, but yes, I appreciate that. Yeah. So. That, that's the conclusion of the findings. As we talked about earlier, immediately after that, it was the summary that's been on the screen a couple of times. And then immediately after that, the corrective action plan, which is the schools uh, write up of, of their management responses. So any other questions on the activity funds uh, audit in, in general? Uh, I'll just I'll just have a closing comment on it. I uh, I was getting ready to say I think when I was watching the pre your presentation a week or so ago, uh, Ted to the school board, uh, I've seen this happen before. Sometimes I just don't have any questions, and I don't think it's because they don't care. I think it's be, you know, first of all, they've got so many things to worry about, you know, issues that they're dealing with. Uh, but then sometimes I think it's an acceptance of or on their part too. Well, what else are we going to do? But I know. From talking to you and some other folks, I don't think they're any more happier with it than we are. So maybe we can continue to look into this. Uh, maybe if we have a, a meeting next month and find an answer who, with, uh, maybe we can start getting some uh, responses from folks a little higher up in the school system and what they think can, can't be done or where, where can we go. So yeah. uh, I, I will say that I did meet separately with Garrett and with Ron McPherson and with uh, the superintendent himself. Okay. Uh, so to go over the findings and I also had a separate uh, meeting with the school board chair. Um, so I, I know it's very much on their minds. Of course, it's been quite a crazy year uh, in, in schools this year and they have other things they're tackling as well, but, but I know they'd like to get back to being able to ad address these issues all right, any other questions of Ted on this subject from anybody? All right, let's move on to the next item on the agenda, which uh, I intentionally put it right after Ted since it deals with the Pew contract. Um, I sent you all a package, I think maybe you got it. I, the goal of that package I sent you was just to tell you how we got from where Pew used to be, the, our external auditors, and they were gonna have to end after eight years to how we changed it through the, um, uh, we actually had a, 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 a change that had to, it was, a, it was an ordinance change, I think you call it. So it literally had to be voted on by the, uh, 
by, by Knox County voters. And uh, similar to what y'all had to do this year on the, the charter agreement, uh, uh, however, or, or I'm not, yeah, you all were looking at the whole charter and any changes to that. But with this one, it was, of course, just to, to the timing of it. And basically, uh, we didn't want to have to be forced to end after the end of eight years. And so that's really what we were changing. And so now we're on a, a fiscal year basis that we're looking at. And I believe where we're headed into right now, it would be Pew's either ninth or 10th year. So it's not like we've gone way over what we had already pretty much contracted to because we'd already done the first four year option and we were pretty far along in the second year option, four year option when we did this. So, um, uh, and I'm gonna let um, uh, Matt Myers is on and maybe Matt, if you could talk to him a little bit about the problem with when we do wanna either, I don't wanna say change, but at least go out for quotes. And if we don't go out for quotes, it's a pretty easy deal. But when we do go out for quotes, uh, it, it's not a two, it's not a one or two, three month process. So, so if, you, if you could address that, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for everybody, I'm Matt Myers, Procurement Director, Knox County Procurement. Uh, as Chairman Morrison said, the uh, charter was changed. You know, it was that we had a eight year cycle or up to an eight year cycle that could be four or eight, but no more than an eight year cycle. Uh, the charter amendment was put on the ballot. It was approved. So now the audit committee can approve uh, audit professional auditing services year after year after year. Um, we are, unfortunately, at this time, because everything changed, we were July 1st to June 30th. Last year, we changed this contract to be in April 1 to March 31st. So at this point, for next fiscal year's um, auditing contract, we're really looking at a renewal with Pew and Company. Um, I have sent uh, Chairman Morrison a, a copy of a, a simple renewal. It is a little bit more than that. This is an agreement that, you know, Pew would sign and, and Ted can step in here. Once that's done and we want to renew, there is documents from the state of Tennessee that they incorporate into this agreement. Um, so once that's all said and done and we're ready to go for the next fiscal year, just due to the nature of, of, of this service. Um, my, my department procurement needs a good six months. Uh, and the reason we need a good six months is, you know, we need to fully vet all of the submittals that we may get. Um, we're likely to do interviews with either a few or all of the submittals. Um, we, you know, need to assemble a good group of which would include the schools and county finance and um, uh, whoever else we might need to to create an evaluation committee to to review these to score these to rank these and then we can go you know into the interview process from that point so I really am asking for a good six months and I know that sounds like a long time but I'm asking for a good six months to for when the decision is made, let's just say to, you know, to put this back out for solicitation. Uh, I need about six months just to get the process done. The, a new contract would start April 1st. Um, so, you know, let's just say that the next, in 2021, uh, sometime in the September, October timeframe, I would need to know if we're going to renew Pew's contract uh, again, or, or, you know, it's the will of the body, the uh, audit committee to go out for um, an RFQ to solicit these services and have the time to, you know, as I said, fully vet those who have submitted, come up with the recommendation and submit that to the audit committee for approval. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I think I'm kind of explain what I needed to, unless there's something else or questions that someone may have. Well, well I appreciate it. And let me um, add a few things on here. When I closed our last meeting in October, it was kind of, we were kind of, you know, getting down to the end. Then I said to this other business, I'll bring this up about Pew 
I thought we were going to meet again in either November or December. We didn't. And I had also overlooked the fact that we had changed from a start period of July, which if we had addressed it in November or December, if we wanted to, to resolicit, uh, that still would have worked. But then again, I had forgotten that, hey, we scooted that up to April. And so now here we are right now in, in, in January. And there's nothing to keep us from saying we still want to do that for the April 1 uh, <laughs> award. Now, that's going to cause everybody a lot of heartburn in doing that. Um, so I don't think we're outside the reasonable range of keeping an auditor around too long. I, when we went through this process of do it, asking for the charter amendment, I, I, I spoke to a lot of different cities, counties. How did they do it? Nobody had the mandatory, after X years, you can't do it anymore. But most of them felt, in the, at most in the range of 10 years, maybe a little more, a little less, was, was about as far as they feel comfortable going without resoliciting. And, and Matt, do I remember right, when you did the second four-year option on this one, did you resolicit at that time or just award? Did you go out no, for this, this was a, this was a, uh, a renewal of the original okay. award done back in, gosh, what was that, 15? So we, we've not really tested the waters for going on 10 years. Uh, but That's we are great. where we are now. And I, I'm, I'm, what we did a year ago is we, we said, we took a vote and said, okay, we're going to agree to go one more year. And we took a vote on that, and that's what we did. Uh, a little bit later, Mac brings along the, the actual PO itself for approval. And so that's where we are now, and April 1 is coming up. Uh, Matt's got the uh, – I, I, I recognize the, the, the form you're going to use. But I feel like now, even though it's a, we don't have as much choice, we still ought to go ahead and vote on, on, the, or on this item. Uh, kind of as I've worded it here, that we would do a for the audit period beginning fiscal or July 1 and go through uh, June 30th of 2001, 21, and that's the fiscal year. And it has the performance period of April 1, 2021, and ending in March 31, 2022. That's uh, and then uh, so while I think we need a, I'd like, I'd like to vote on that, but I'll follow up with saying. Next August, September, I'm going to be of the strong opinion that we, that we need to, to, to at least revisit this. And, and it's kind of like some of the problems with the school uh, internal control issues. At a point, you just feel like, no, I've got, we, we've got to do something different. I don't mean change audits. I just mean resolicit and show that we're at least for the county, we're reassessing and what's out there in, in firms, et cetera. So I don't know, does anybody want to get, uh, put forward a motion on this? Just to be sure I understand it correctly, the motion would be just for what we've defined in here as fiscal year 2021, right? And then the second part would be Correct. not covered under the motion. Right, right. It would, just, it would take the next, uh, it would July 21, 2020 through 2021, am I saying that right? Yeah, because right now we're just finishing the audit, to, the, the, the audit period that finished June 30th of 2020. That's why it always confuses me a little bit, am I saying the right years? <laughs> yes, it's the upcoming fiscal year. Yeah. I'm in agreement with basically how Jim has laid it out. I, I'm willing to make the motion for the fiscal year 2021 renewal. I think we do need to reconsider, especially as we get further into the year, making sure that we're doing the proper timeline um, because I do think it is worth going through the, the RFQ process in the not too distant future. I'll second that motion. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Kim, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Morrison votes aye. Mr. Warren? Aye. Mr. Warren votes aye. Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. All members present, voting aye. Great. Well, the ayes have it. I appreciate y'all. Let me struggle through that whole description there. It's, it confuses me every time. All right, the next item is item number seven, and that's a, a, a report from Chris and Perry, whoever's gonna present that. They sent out some schedules earlier in the week. 
Uh, and obviously the CAFR is not going to be ready for this month's review. And my head wouldn't be able to deal with it if we were trying to do it in this meeting. So, uh, Chris, are you taking this? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm just going to go through page by page from what was sent out because it's not final and it's still in draft form. Um, I'll just kind of speak in generalities. And I think you had mentioned something about sales tax that we'll try to answer. And then I'll answer any of your questions that you have. Um, starting with the general fund, um, we will end this year uh, about $6.6 .6 million ahead of where we were for, for 2020, ahead of 2019, as far as total fund balance goes. Uh, the important piece of that is unassigned fund balance, which we increased by $4.4 million. Uh, so to put that in, into perspective to uh, uh, from what we had budgeted for, we had budgeted for a $1.78 million use of fund balance. And uh, instead we added 4.4 million to unassigned fund balance. So general fund uh, really performed well um, for, for 2020. And um, you can turn to the income statement, which would be the second page that you received. And you'll see that revenue on the top was about $6 million ahead of 2019. Um, the expense piece uh, was $5.2 million, less than what it was the previous year. That's where we put a, a spending freeze on at the, you know, uh, around the end of March related to, uh, to, uh, to, to COVID. And so we, so that's how you saw a reduction in expenses and uh, in other financing sources and uses, uh, we were um, down about 6.2 million as well. And so you add all those together and that's how you get to our uh, uh, 6.6 .6 million dollars in change in, in, in fund balance. Um, Chairman, I think you, you had a question on the income statement page uh, related to maybe public safety, is that correct? Right, I compared this, what I was wondering about the, what you're giving us now is probably gonna be pretty close to what the, you're gonna end up with on the CAFR. And I also glanced at what you gave us last October and I noticed the numbers even last October held steady with this presentation. It, like, I won't say exact dollars, but revenue was pretty much dead on three months ago. And then, but there was one item that, that changed about $3 million in the expenses. And I think that was the uh, public safety. So I'm just curious what that was. Correct. And what that was, was a, was a reversing entry that we did re reversing CARES Act expenses from the Sheriff's Department back, um, oh, back to the, the Sheriff's Department from the CARES Act grant. So uh, we had about four or five reversing entries back and forth with CARES Act um, that was related to them saying something was eligible, that something wasn't eligible back and forth. And so the change that you saw was a reversing entry that was related to the CARES Act back to the Sheriff's Department. But that didn't change anything to the total CARES money or anything, correct? Correct. No, it was, uh, we, we had to submit our total expenses to CARES Act, which was well in excess of what we had received. And they're still finalizing those as well. Is there a rumor around that we've gotten some more CARES money or? Uh... Well, there's a rumor that the schools have got more CARES Act money, which I think is, is factual. Uh, from the county standpoint, we've not received anything else. Okay. Uh, moving on to public improvement. Uh, these next two pages are basically related to our capital projects and the changes in those always relate to timing. It's when we issue bonds. And so um, I won't spend too much time on those just to show that those are positive as to where we were and the negative and all that is related to timing. Um, moving on to what would be page five debt service, you will see that we uh, reduced fund balance and debt service by about 400,000. To compare that to what we had budgeted, we had budgeted a $6.2 million use of fund balance. So instead of using 6.2 million, we only used 400,000. So that um, relates to, we will always budget uh, about um, 
four or four and a half percent on variable rate debt. So when that doesn't equate to that, then we have savings there. And you will also see on the next page down in other financing sources, uh, transfers from other funds. We did a $1.6 million transfer from the general fund into debt service fund to also help out to get that, that, that number down from $2 million use of fund balance down to about 400,000. And so we wanted to keep that, that number at a, at a healthy cushion. So we made that transfer. Uh, going on to the next page, uh, which is a combining um, balance sheet of our special re revenue funds. I will probably go to page 177, which is um, the combining statement of, of revenues and expenses. I'm just going to touch on a on a few of, of these items here. Um, going right in the middle of the page to public library, if you go down under other financing sources, um, you will see that we had a, a, a transfer from other funds for $540,000. The budget for that was actually a um, million forty thousand. We didn't make the, the full amount because that is a transfer from hotel motel fund and hotel motel fund got really hit hard uh, through COVID. So we did not make that complete and total transfer. Thus you saw a, a negative net change in fund balance of about 289 thousand dollars in, in, in public libraries. Going over a fund to solid waste, same line, you will see a transfer from uh, other funds of 100, uh, excuse me, of 1.4 million dollars. The budget on that for the year was actually 842,765 dollars. So we ended up transferring 600,000 dollars additional to solid waste just to get that fund to break even. And so uh, You've probably heard this spill before, but solid waste is a fund um, that when um, the sale of recycled materials are down, it really does not perform well or does not break even. So oftentimes it results in us doing additional transfers from other funds. And this was one of those years. Uh, and it kind of re relates to the fund on the end, which is engineering and public works. You will see that transfers from other funds um, was 1.65 million. That budget was 2.3 million. So that fund performed so well, we did not have to do uh, the additional $700,000 transfer from general fund. But what we did do was we had to transfer two other funds. The 925,000 went to solid waste. We had, we had a budget of 575. So we transferred more, which we had talked about previously. And um, that's how that ended up. And so if you look on the very end uh, at the total line, you will see that net change in fund balance was a total, just a uh, negative $150,000. Once you calculate all that, and a lot of that's in constitutional officers uh, where they use more money this year than was taken in because of the pandemic. Moving on to internal service funds, and I'll skip um, the net position and go straight to the, the statement of revenue and expenses and just focus on a couple of items here. Uh, fourth column over is self-insurance. This is our risk management fund. You will see that the change in, in net position for the year was a $2.3 million to the positive to get us a total net position in that fund of 4.7 million. I point this out because in FY16, this fund had a negative $3.6 million net position and we came up with a plan with Pew and company to get this fund uh, to a positive net position. So since FY16, we have increased this fund uh, by $8.3 million in a positive way. And now we would say that this year was helped by the pandemic uh, with people working from home and not driving as much. We didn't have as many accidents. So that did help this year. Uh, going to the very end, self health insurance, which is our uh, health care fund uh, that is self-insured, you will see that we had a change in, in that position of this year of $1.6 million to the good, bringing our total net position to $16.7 million. I would point out a couple of things here. In FY16, this fund had a $4 million net position. We have made a concerted effort to 
to increase that, that, that net position. And we've currently got it to 16.7 million, which uh, is, is very healthy. Uh, this fund also was helped this year um, by the pandemic because uh, a, a lot of people during uh, March through June wasn't able to do some elective surgeries. But we also re re reduced our revenue as when we did the furloughs, we did not charge health insurance pre premiums for a couple of months. And so we, we backed that off and still had a, a positive net position of, of, of 1.6 million. So we are really uh, happy with how we ended the fiscal year. It, it's, it's positive. I just wanted to focus on those major funds and those combining statements. And then uh, I'll answer any of your questions. Our, our sales taxes, I know the last time we met, you showed us how, I guess, uh, the, the July numbers that came in in September were greater than what we got last year as, as a way of trending. Are we up or down? Uh, yeah, and uh, great, great question, Mr. Chairman. We actually got, before this meeting, just right before this meeting, we got sales tax in today for November collections. So it would be the November collections, which we got today. And those uh, numbers just county related, not counting the city of Knoxville or the town of Farragut, those funds that we account for was 1.17 million more than the same month of a year ago, which is a 7.71% increase. And so if we look uh, for the five months to, to, to date, so July through, through November, uh, we're at about 5.9 million more than we were this time a year ago, which equates to about 8.1%. So sales tax continues to do re really well. Um, we know a lot of that relates to online sales, um, but, but we continue to see positive number in sales tax. All right, any other questions for Chris? Uh, Commissioner Jay, I have an item on the end of that one that maybe we can talk about. Uh, either when we talk about the last item or uh, as far as maybe combining the audit committee meeting with particularly the CAFR next month when they present that to, to both all the commissioners and turn around and present it to the audit committee again. I'd like to blend that in somehow, but, and you mentioned okay. maybe trying to combine that, but we've touched base. Yeah, we can on work that. on that. Yeah. All right. So next we have, uh, well, I guess internal audit's going to be doing number eight and nine, but we're going to get the presentation of the trustee's office commission. Uh, and Wendell, are you doing that one? Um, I'm, an, I'm going to do it. Wendell's having some technical difficulties on his end, and he's afraid that he's going to be like glitching the whole time. So <laughs> okay. um, he's going to pipe in. I'm going to I'm going to try and handle this one. He's definitely the subject matter expert, I think, for the county on trustees commission expense um, now. Um, so I hope um, if anybody didn't get the report and um, we sent it out, I think Thursday, I believe Thursday, um, um, it was a little, it was separate than my, our package. Um, but it, first off the report, I know Commissioner Jay and Commissioner Beeler might not have seen one of our audit reports before, um, but this one looks a little different. So this, we tried out a new format since some of the subjects that we audit can be so in depth and the reports can get so long and wordy. Um, we try to, to make it more concise and just get to the meat of the issues a lot faster. Um, so this one does have a little bit of background and um, what we looked at was the trustees commission fees, the amount of money that they the trustees office charges for processing cash for certain for certain funds and purposes for the county. Um, and on the background page, there's a brief summary of the percentages. So the percentages range from um, zero where they're exempt from commission to 3% where they would take 3% of the funds that are processed. Now, does, does, does the state stipulate these percentages? Yes. So that's, that's really, I guess, I interpret this that of all the monies that come into the trustee's office, they will get a commission that really is to cover their operating costs or most of them, or is, is, is that what that's for? It's supposed to cover um, their, their salaries and benefits costs okay. of their personnel. 
And so for people who might not be familiar, it's not a commission in terms of sales commission to sales no. person, something like that. Yes. Okay, good. Yes, it's, and so all of those um, percentages are set by the TCA code. Um, and so that's what we used as our reference um, to determine if things were being properly charged was the TCA code. There's also some state guidance and some CTAS guidance out there that we referenced as well. Um, so on page two of the report, you can just see just an overview of the amount of money that was processed in commissions. Um, the FY19, we looked at FY19 when we started this project, FY20 hadn't been completed. So we looked back at FY19, um, about $9.4 million in commission expense um, was charged for that period. Um, it is from two different sources. One is property tax, which the trustee's office um, calculates and handles. And that was 63% of the 9.4 million. And the other Third, third of it basically is from miscellaneous revenue. So um, the commission can also be charged on non-property tax transactions. Um, miscellaneous revenue um, is calculated by the finance office. So we ended up pulling the trustee's office and finance into the audit. We originally just um, had intended it for to be the trustee's office, but since finance has some responsibility in calculating and processing the miscellaneous revenue piece of it, we looked at their process as well. Um, there's some basic background on, on page two and three. We put it um, just brief, because this process is extremely complex. So this is very high level. Um, basically, it covers what I've said, that the property tax is done by the trustee's office. They have a process that they calculate it. Um, and then the non-revenue part of it or not, or miscellaneous revenue part of it is done by the um, the finance office, and there are several funds um, that are pro if money meets certain criteria and goes through um, one of the funds that are applicable, then the finance office would um, process that. So that's on page three and four. I'm gonna. Unless anybody has any specific questions about the process, I'm just gonna kind of get into the findings if that's okay with everybody. Um, we did put something, um, what we use is our criteria, which we've actually ordered for everybody. And we're gonna talk about it later on our audit plan too. Um, we use the green book and the green book is, if you haven't heard about it, it's um, the, gov the gen government accountability offices book it has a green cover, like we follow the yellow book. This one's green, it's the green book. Um, it's a, a compilation, basically a sum of the COSO, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, control framework that's applicable for governments. Um, we are required to comply with the green book at some level um, by the state. Um, so we are using that as our criteria. And since we haven't really covered that in depth in audit committee or in our reports, um, we kind of gave a brief overview on page five of what the green book is. We've actually ordered for everybody on the audit committee, we've ordered you a green book. I know it's gonna be super exciting reading, um, but we will be referencing it quite a bit in our audits going forward. Um, since it is the control structure and the control framework, um, that's a really good set of criteria to use. Um, and our peer review actually said, you know, you guys need to be using the green book more and more. So for, for criteria setting. So we've taken that to heart um, and we are going to start doing that. And hey, so, Andrea, uh, yes. sorry, one comment, just for the other folks on the audit committee, this is really what came out of the whole Sar Sarbanes-Oxley issues, you know, around turn of century and, and the, this, this same set of COSO principles and mostly it's internal control type principles that that's, you know, went to all the publicly traded companies and uh, big and small, and they had some different phasing periods. So this mirrors an awful lot of that. And it just took a while for it to be pushed on the government. So uh, right. if, um, if that puts it in perspective. Yes. So this is um, just a very brief overview of what it is. Um, basically, it has some components that relate to certain periods. There's a cube in the middle. Um, and we will go, we're going to do, we're going to provide you all a book. And part of what um, 
I'm going to talk about a little later is we're actually, I'm going to, I want to do a training with the audit committee on the green book and kind of go through what it is. So I'm going to keep it pretty high level today, knowing that later we can uh, kind of deep dive into it in a training or kind of, a, so you guys have some more familiarity with it. Um, so on our conclusions, this was a new um, way we set it up. And I hope that you all liked this. Um, we basically asked questions on if we met our objectives or not and answered them very clearly and then tied it to the findings. So it was kind of a very quick, here's yes or no, and here's why it's no, and here's the findings. So you can go read about it. Um, so we asked four questions. Um, was the FY19 property tax trustee commission calculated and recorded correctly. And we said yes. Um, for the property tax side of it, the county trustee did correctly calculate and record it. Um, the second question was, was FY19 miscellaneous revenue trustee commission calculated and recorded correctly? And we answered that no, because we had several findings that, um, that needed to be improved for us to answer yes. So. Those findings, um, we'll get into them later, but real briefly, they related to um, codes that should have been exempt being used, um, commission expense overstated, um, the, F, the commission combined additional periods um, that shouldn't have been included, revenue codes were not coded, were not considered for part of it, um, and then some revenue codes didn't follow the guidance that we were using. Um, the next question we looked at was, was FY 2019 cash retained appropriately in the trustees fee and operating account pursuant to Tennessee statute? Um, the trustee can withhold three months, basically, 90 days of um, fee commission fees. And then, and that's based on a calculation and on agreed upon at the beginning of the year, what the, um, salaries and benefits are going to be. Um, so what we did was we looked at it real fast. We calculated three months and compared it to what was in the account. Um, and so generally, no, those did not meet that threshold um, that there was cash withheld routinely more than allowed by the TCA. Um, and then they had not provided supporting documentation in the general ledger for some, um, some of the journal entries. And then our last question was, were policies and procedures codified related to the calculation, recording, and retention of the Trustees Commission? And we answered that no. Um, there were no written policies and procedures. And then uh, we had another concern about um, secession planning in the trustee's office to, that um, some employees are getting close to the age of retiring and very key roles. And we would um, want to, we have a recommendation for secession planning in that area. Um, so. I'll jump into the findings. The first finding related to non-compliance with TCA for BEP funding. And basically what happened is that in 19, oh gosh, I'm gonna get it wrong. There, it was like 1991-92 is the base year for BEP funding. And what the state did is said, we're gonna calculate the amount of commission you can take based on this fixed rate and you can't take anything over it. No matter if you have 200, I think we had $200 million in BP, BP funding. Is that right, Wendell? Yes, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, and we, it doesn't matter. We can't take a certain percentage of that. We can take a fixed amount. Um, and in that fixed amount, there are certain, once they're included in that fixed amount, you can't count them again. You can't count those, those specific expense codes or area um, organization codes again. And what happened that we found was that um, for fiscal years 13 through 19, there were two accounts related to driver education and career ladder that were already included in the fixed rate that we were getting. And we, so we, we counted them twice. We included them in the fixed rate and then we counted them again. So we said, you can't count these. Um, finance, remove these revenue codes um, and they posted a journal entry to correct 2020. So these aren't gonna be counted anymore. So we don't have a recommendation um, specifically to correct this because they've already done it. Um, what we are recommending 
is that they make the school system whole for the amounts taken contrary to the state statute. So because it's BEP funding and it's so specific to that area, um, we recommend that they take um, and make the school system whole for that money. And I will, I don't know, Jim, do you, do you want me to do uh, responses as well, we talk I'll just about do real quickly. I just do real quickly with this because just like you said about transferring the money back to the school, did that, did they agree to do that or not? I, I thought there's some debate as to, uh, I'm gonna look. and it may be later on in your, all this detail, but you can just tell us that real quick. Yeah, finance and, and Chris and Perry can talk about this as well. I mean, they can jump in at any time. Um, finance concurred with the finding. Um, they've corrected it. Um, their response says that it should be noted that the county trustee is entitled to collect an additional commission on certain other school funds per TCA 811-110F and that it chose to forego that it chose to forego. Considering this, county and school finance personnel have agreed to accept that the commission calculation is correct going forward, but due to the sensitivity of this area, we plan to review the aforementioned Tennessee code with the law department for further clarification. That's so, good, because really they agreed with it, but they did make the transfer because they had another offset they, they could apply right. to. Right, yes, and so we, our response is based on our discussions with the law department, um, we continue to recommend that they make the school system whole um, unless the law department advises them all otherwise, of course. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so they are going to um, consult with the law department for further clarification on that one. So as you go through the rest of these, maybe if you can sort of give us their, their position real okay. quickly, could that yeah. help move it along? No problem at all. Okay, finding two um, relates to the overstatement of commission expense in the 2019 CAFR. Um, what we looked at, the, the commission expense is calculated using a crystal report. And what the crystal report does is it queries the general ledger system, it pulls out a specific set of data, it applies a calculation, and then that amount that it calculates is then entered back into the general ledger system as the commission expense. Um, what we found was there was an error in the report used to calculate the commission expense. Basically, it was, instead of pulling a 12 month period, it was pulling 14 months. So it was pulling July 1st of, say for, for 2019, it was pulling July 1st of 2018 through July, August, August 30th, of, of 2019, yes. I see I, Perry and Chris are nodding, so I've got that right. Um, so what it did, there was, a, there was an error in the query. Instead of pulling one fiscal year, it was pulling one fiscal year plus the first two periods of the next fiscal year. Um, and because of that, we found um, for 2019 that it resulted in a excess commission expense reported in the CAFR of 55,824. Um, so, so that was of course something we, we uh, were concerned about. Um, we met with finance to talk to them about this. Um, they, did, um, they did eventually correct it. We talked to them in October. Um, we talked to them in the summer. They, they thought it was fixed. It, we pulled it again and checked it. It wasn't fixed. In October, we notified them we didn't think it was fixed yet because um, we didn't want the 2020 financial statements to be incorrect. So as of after October, um, they did correct it. And the 2020 financial statement, when they did the journal entries, it's not going to be incorrect in the 2020 financial statement that finance did correct that. Um, then, so if you look on page eight, um, Part of the amount that was overstated would have been swept back into the, the general fund. So when the trustee, if they collect fees over their agreed upon amount at the end of the fiscal year, um, anything that's, in, that's considered excess is swept back into the general fund. So we get it back. Um, 
So of that 55,000, um, which was partly due to the query and then the 10,000 for 2019, that was from the BEP funding. So in total, there was 66,469 in FY19 that was overstated. Um, 45,425 would have normally been swept back into the general fund. Um, and so um, we did ask finance as well. We do consider this to be significant um, since it is a calculation that goes into the financial statement. But thankfully, this was the only query that was used, was calculating parts of the financial statement. Everything else was pulled directly from the general ledger through their engagement software. This was the only outside calculation that was happening. So that's a good thing. Um, we use, under our criteria here, you'll see we use these uh, COSO, which is refers to the, that, that green book, that control um, structure. Um, principle 10, management should design control activities to achieve, achieve objectives and respond to risks. And then principle 11, management should design the entity information system and related control activities to achieve, object, achieve objectives and respond to risks. Um, um, we did make three recommendations for this. Um, determine which accounting funds were charged excess commission fees and make those funds whole because not all of them are general fund funds. Some of them are separate funds. Um, determine that the calculations were correct for previous years dating back to 2011. Um, we, we didn't go back um, to look at the other years. Um, we asked finance to go back and determine if those years were incorrect. Um, 2011 would have been when we started using Munis. That's why we used 2011 as the cutoff. Um, and then um, also the third recommendation would be determine if any action is necessary to the financial statements through the overstatement for FY19 in previous years. Um, I, I'm going to go down to their response in the back of this report, but um, basically, this it isn't a very big amount. It is an error, but it's not a huge error. So it's not material and nothing needs to be done to the financial statements to account for it. Um, um, they have corrected the crystal report query. Um, they did um, the funds and related amounts um, not swept back. So of that 66 and the 45 were swept back into the general fund. If they were not swept back, finance said they will be reviewed and a determination of the amount to be paid back will be made. So they are looking at that. Um, so they are working on those recommendations and determining what needs to be done to make those accounts whole if needed. Um, on to finding three. Um, the trustee routinely retained more cash than allowed by statute. Um, like I explained earlier, there's a statute that says that the trustee can basically retain three times um, the monthly total, which is basically three months. Um, so what we did is we looked at their, um, their FY19 letter in agreement with the mayor that stated their salaries and benefits. We took the max that they could take um, and basically divided it by 12 to get down to the monthly amount and then compared that amount to what was in their bank balance. Um, so, and you can see in table four, um, there were 10 months that were outside of the limit. And so based on our calculation, the limit was $501,748.45. So that's what we used as our threshold when we compared it. Um, our criteria, like I said, was the TCA that requires it to be held um, in, that, in that certain amount and then the letter of agreement with, um, with the county. And then our recommendation is for the Knox County Trustee's Office to develop and implement a process to ensure compliance throughout the given year with TCA. So make sure every month that we're within the bounds, not just, so we did a good job at the very first month and the very last month, we just need to get that middle ground under control. Um, and the trustee's office um, responded that they, um, let me make sure I'm in the right place. Yes. Um, the trustee's office um, is going to be reviewing those um, on a monthly basis to make sure that those are properly 
excess fees are turned over on a monthly basis versus an annual basis. All right. Um, on finding four, this kind of correlates with our second finding um, in that the query results lack quality control review. And as we discussed, we looked at the query related that pulls the commission and calculates it um, and that it included two periods of revenue that should not have been included. Um, we talked to, based on conversations with county employees, we know that a crystal report to pull this has been used since 2011, but we couldn't identify how far this went back because the query was overwritten every year. Um, instead, normally in an audit world, you'd want the query, you'd want to save the query, and then you write a new query, um, but you save a copy of the query language you used. Um, that wasn't the case. It was um, overwritten with the new query every year. So we couldn't just, usually you can do a quick and dirty, hey, what does the query said? Does it match? Oh, we have a problem. Um, we can't do that. Um, and so we, since it was overwritten, we couldn't review the query easily to determine how many years this took place. Um, the, our other concern is that the query, we couldn't find that it had been re reconciled for accuracy. Um, there's, no, there's no quality control where the, um, there's a process where the results would be compared before giving it to the end user to make sure the query is pulling in accurate information. Um, and normally, even with informational queries, we'd want them to be right. And the end user often doesn't know if the query is correct or not. They just look at the information and assume that it's correct. Um, so they might not be able to catch it. So um, adding in our recommendations for that are to correct the crystal report for accuracy, which I believe they did, um, to save queries for quality control purposes and to maintain an audit trail. Um, and then to validate queries genu generated for any request um, with control totals to ensure that the source data and generated data are accurate. So just putting in a little bit extra step to make sure that the information we're giving out um, really reflects what's in the system in the way that we want it to. Because just the crystal report queries Munis and Munis is a very complex system that has a lot of fields and a lot of data. If you pick the wrong field, it can change the whole results of the query. Um, and those background tables and fields often change during updates. So it'd be really important that we're looking at that and, and addressing those issues. I'm gonna look at their responses. Um, let's see. Uh, fine, uh, management has concurred that they're going to save their queries. So um, they're not gonna overwrite them. They're gonna make sure a copy is saved. Um, they are, uh, they're going to addi implement additional controls to verify the accuracy of reports um, that are being generated. And like I said, they already corrected the query for 2019. Sorry, I'm, I'm having to go back and forth in the report a little bit. Okay, um, finding five, revenue accounts not coded for commission calculation. Um, we, we asked for a report to determine um, how the codes are calculated, how they're even pulled into the crystal report and considered. Um, what the crystal report does is it looks at a beginning effective date. And based on that effective date, which could be, and in 2000, 2001, or 2002, the year represents the commission taken. So if it's 2000, the commission is zero. It's calculating zero commission. If it's 2001, it's calculating 1% commission on that line. If it's 2002, it's two. Um, what we found was that out of the 4,998 revenue codes um, that the county had in place during the audit period, 1,665 were not populated with a beginning effective field as of October, 2020. So basically the query wasn't considering those fields at all. It wasn't even looking at them because it didn't have that qualifier to say that it gets this, it was just blank. Um, so that resulted in those 1,665 revenue codes failing to be considered for commission in the 2020 year end query that had already been ran. <laughs> um, I'm going on mute. <laughs> um, 
uh, we looked at those uh, 1,665 to determine if they were new accounts because we did have COVID um, in, in part of uh, the, the 2020 year. And we wanted to make sure we, we weren't just all new accounts. Um, but most were not considered new and had been active for several years. Um, so um, we uh, did, Knox County did update that. They sent a file with only five revenue codes that didn't have a beginning date. And as of December 3rd, Binance said they reviewed all the revenue codes and made all corrections. So we don't have a recommendation um, to correct those fields for them because they did correct it during the audit. Um, we do um, have a recommendation for finance to ensure that all revenue accounts are coded prior to running each trustee's commission report each year, because if a new code is created, a new revenue code is created, it could be missed. We've done all of them that are in place today, but if we create new ones, especially with the ever-changing um, COVID rules and, and getting different grant money, we may miss one. So we need a process in place to make sure we're adding those in properly. And... The um, finance uh, concurred with the recommendation. They set up controls to review revenue codes quarterly and prior to running the commission report. So they have put a new process in place to address that already. Okay. Uh, finding seven, no, sorry, finding six, I was skipping one. Finding six relates to lack of succession planning. And like um, we, I stated earlier, um, the trustee's office has a veteran staff with excellent experience. Um, there are key personnel and pivotal accounting roles um, that are already past the average age of retirement. Um, if they leave, we would lose a lot of institutional knowledge um, and it could have a detrimental impact on the continuity of the trustee's office in that accounting role. Um, so we, recommend that they have a succession plan to facilitate the smooth transfer of knowledge from those key employees to the future employees so that we don't run the risk that we have a gap in skills or our ability to perform jobs in the trustee's office. And Um, the trustee's office responded, they concur with the recommendation, will implement controls to have current employees journalize their task instructions for new and hires, new hires or transfers. Um, prior to receiving the final draft of the audit findings, they've already um, put in a process where newly assigned tasks of OTAs and purchasing were implemented with written instructions. They will continue to cross train uh, their employees and continue to develop detailed job descriptions for key roles. When the need arises, they will consider the recommended qualifications to ascertain and ensure that new employees can adequately perform the required functions of the job. Um, we did have a, just a little bit more to add to that. Um, we concur with their responses foundational steps, um, but we encourage them to formalize their succession plan to make sure it's in place and documented um, and to expand their succession planning to include um, identification of key positions and the timing of needed replacement, annual evaluation of the plan to ensure that all potential, potential people leaving are identified, um, and that the skills and training needed by employees um, are identified so they can, be go they can go ahead and get those, those skills in place before they need to have that in for that position, to fill a position. All right. Um, finding seven, um, findings one through six, um, were, we did consider significant also. Um, so all of those were significant. These are our other findings um, that are not significant. Um, commissions were collected contrary to UTC task guidance. Um, we found 113,893 of excess commission um, taken for revenue accounts that we thought should be exempt based on the CTAS guidance. Um, the finance has reviewed as of December 3rd, the CTAS guidance um, and coded commission calculations accordingly. So since they've just done that, we're not, we don't have a recommendation because they fixed it before the audit report came out. Um, finding eight relates to lack of written policies and procedures. 
we found that the Knox County Trustee's Office and Finance Office did not have written departmental procedures um, or policies that relate to commission fees and how they're calculated and collected. Um, we love policies and procedures um, as auditors because they set clear guidelines and expectations of how the process is supposed to work every single time. Um, and so we recommend that they um, add the commission collection process in the Knox County Internal Manual, the Internal Control Manual, it's not included in there. Um, and we also um, suggest that they develop an accurate and detailed breakdown of who's, respons who's responsible for what with detailed formalized procedures for both Knox County and Knox, um, Knox County Finance and the trustee's office so that the commission process and the calculations, it is very complex that it's, documented on what we're doing and who's responsible for it and when it needs to be done. I'm gonna look at those. Okay. Um, finance has said that they will incorporate the commission process into the internal control manual and um, finance and the trustees office have concurred that they will develop additional information as it relates to the processes for the collection of the commissions. And then our last finding was lack of supporting documentation in Munis for the trustees retention of cash entries. Um, and we looked at the all the, the journal entries that related to um, the trustees commission office and and for the ones that related to the retention of cash in the trustee's fee and operating account, um, not all of them were adequately supported. Um, and so we would expect to see a journal entry with the, all the documentation attached in Munis. We could get it from the paper backup in the trustee's office, but it wasn't in the financial system. And since the financial system is the actual financial record for Knox County, we recommended that all the supporting documentation be included in Munis. Um, and the trustee's office has concurred with that um, and it ordered scanners for all Munis, for all Munis end users. And they've already received those and they've begun installation so that they can make sure that all the documentation is scanned into the system. Um, overall, that, so that's our audit. Overall, it was very insightful. Um, Wendell and Richard Pugh, who's our auditor too, they did an excellent job on this very complex process. And the trustee's office and uh, finance office were just so patient with all of our questions and very forthright and forthcoming um, to our questions. Um, Ed and Chris and Perry were very helpful in, in this audit, of course, and we appreciate um, their patience and making sure we understand the process correctly. Um, and uh, talking through all the findings, we, we talked to them all about all this up front um, and they were uh, very open and receptive to our, um, our suggestions. So that is that. Does anybody have any questions or Perry and Chris or Ed, would you like to add anything? No, Andrew, you've covered uh, our responses very adequately and completely, I think, and we'll do our best to address these things or we, we have addressed them and we'll continue to. And obviously it's a, it's a ongoing uh, process. Um, and we, we learn every day and uh, thank you for all the things you and Wendell found and pointed out to us and we will in coordination with Perry and, and Chris and so forth, we will uh, try to get, get them all processed and, and make sure there's not any problems in the future and continue to work on uh, the succession plans for, as you pointed out, the employees we have that are uh, uh, possibly past retirement age, including myself, I guess. So uh, no, we, we, we don't. I'll try to answer any, any questions if anybody has any of me. I don't have any questions, Andrea, but I just wanted to comment. I think y'all did a very good job. And, and if you think uh, Andrea took you into a deep dive on this report, that think where Wendell's been the last kind of few months with, with a lot of this detail. And But this is what happens. When <laughs> you, 
the internal control issues. And I like the way they, they referenced a lot of the internal control items. You know, I don't know that it would have absolutely presented, prevented them, but it gets you more in line with what can you do to help make sure these don't happen again. And a lot of these weren't large dollars. It was more, it was more the principle of the thing. So again, I think it's a great start towards getting, uh, you know, throughout, throughout the county, better look at the internal controls of everything. So, uh, and uh, Chris, I assume uh, you, it sounds like y'all, y'all are okay with, with your responses and don't have anything to add. Uh, yeah, we appreciate Andrea and Wendell and anything that helps um, make the process better. We're, we're all for. Um, it was, uh, you know, I think Andrea always says it's, it's continuous learning and we agree. And so we, we improve and, and, and make it better and look for forward to working with them again. All right, well, let me get off mute there since my dog was barking again. Um, FedEx and UPS drive the dogs crazy, but uh, okay. I'm, I'm hitting that phase where I'm about to lose my copy of the agenda here, but Andrea, I guess now uh, the internal audit is um, your update and, and the items under there. And Yes. So um, our, I will go in order of this. Um, now there's, a, there's a couple extra documents this time, but the hotline summary, um, we continue to kind of have a steady flow. We started with six cases. We got one. We closed one. Um, we sent another to management response. So we still have four. Um, Three are over three months old and two are internally generated one from the hotline. The reason that we're, these are still in the hopper is because they're just massive and they take a lot of documentation. And I'm the, I'm the hotline person right now. The audit staff's been on um, audit projects. Wendell is helping me now try to clear these up because he finished trustee's office. He has a little bit of time. We're gonna get these out of the queue. Um, I did add two more today to the hotline. So this actually, the, the, our ending total um, as of today is actually six. Um, so we added two more new ones today um, that came in. So um, we are working through those. Um, hopefully the, the ones that came in are a little less massive in scope. They will be hard, uh, easier to get through. Um, the next item on, let me find my is our 2020 audit plan. So each year we're tasked with presenting an audit plan to the audit committee um, to talk about where we think we're gonna go for projects. Um, this year we have um, really five performance audits and then I, I kind of wanted to talk about the sixth thing um, on there. So we have the Knox County payroll audit, that's a carryover. And we have, um, we sent out a, a revised engagement memo and this is kind of getting into the status summary, but um, when once we started that audit, we talked to Chris and Perry and they're actually getting ready to kind of revamp the payroll system and a deep dive look at the current system when it's getting ready to change isn't a lot of value to us. So what we landed on was we're gonna specifically look at withholdings and deductions um, that were related to, to the COVID rules, just to those temporary furloughs, any kind of payroll tax withholdings, anything that was specialized because of COVID to give us some assurance around those areas. Um, and then we're going to do um, a pre-implementation review in real time with the team, the payroll invitation team. We're gonna be a part of the team and give them recommendations on controls, risks, and gaps in real time. We'll present a summary report with what we've reported to them and, and how they fixed it. Um, and um, we'll, we'll work through how we're gonna report on that. It may be some interim reporting with different phases, um, but what it'll give us is a more proactive approach to ensure that the control structure on the front end gives us a better assurance that we're gonna get the on the back end. So we can wait a year and audit this and then have a bunch of recommendations, or we can do it or no recommendation. We could have no recommendations. We could see it's doing great. Um, but at this point, Point, we can be a partner in making sure that the controls, risks, and objectives are being addressed in real time and make recommendations in the process and then summarize them for the audit committee. Um, so we have that one in process, which will be a carryover. Um, we currently are in the fieldwork stage of the ITVPN audit. So that would be um, one that we're carrying over as well. The other areas we looked at this year um, really kind of address some of the issues that we know are, arose from um, 
the, the pandemic response, us being thrown into a pandemic last year. Um, the first one is continuity of operations audit. Uh, we wanna look to see whether Knox County Department's officials, if we have a documented, approved, communicated and tested, tested continuity of operations plan. I think before this year, we never thought we'd be thrown into a virtual environment or furloughs and offices shut down. And now we know we can be very easily and very quickly. And we wanna make sure that going forward, we have everything in place to respond to that quickly, whether it be a pandemic or a natural disaster, a fire, a water pipe burst in the building, do we know what we need to do? And does everybody that needs to know, do they know? Um, the, and the, the next audit on the list is a CARES Act expenditure audit. This would look specifically at if funds were expended in accordance with the rules and regulations set forth in the CARES Act legislation. Um, this would give us a little assurance, um, potentially ahead of the external audit, we could get some areas fixed before um, they come in and if there's areas that we need to address um, with the expenditures, we can get them fixed and uh, corrected appropriately. Commissioner Jay. So I had to unmute. Thanks for, um, thank you very much. Um, first off, this is exceptional work and it's a lot of work. Um, I'm a big fan of audits and checks and balances and always making sure we're keeping an eye on, on how we're doing things internally. With everything that you have going on, you're manning the hotline. Are you, do you have an adequate team to handle this in a growing Knox County or are we operating the way we've operated for the last 20 or 30 years and hope we you know, keep up? Yeah. Well, speaking um, of continuity and bandwidth yeah. and people. Uh, yes, um, I have a vacant position right now that was actually vacant last January and we were trying to fill it and then COVID hit and we put everything on pause. So we do have that position posted now. Um, I think we've been talking about it for years um, as an audit committee on how do we handle the uh, size of the audit department to, versus the size of the county. Um, and when I got here, um, I don't know, I don't think anybody was on audit committee when I got here. I know Ed was on commission when I got here. Um, I had one auditor in my office. It was me and one other person. Um, so we've gradually grown um, over, I've been here for seven years. Um, we've gradually grown. Um, I think that's a great conversation to have. What do we want the, the audit department to look like in terms of what's the right number for Knox County um, and how much work do we want to do? There is a limited number of work that I can do based on the staff that we have. Um, if we want more work, then we'd need uh, to talk about how what, what our staff would look like to, to get that work done and what kind of work we want done. Well, Chairman, I would just, I would encourage you or, or Chris Caldwell to start that conversation and maybe bring it to the audit committee next time we're heading towards budget season and um, there, you know, this that's, is important, important work. And that's the time to address it. And Chris has really been helpful because we, we, we started out kind of uh, the first response was, well, she doesn't have any money in her budget. Well, wait a second. You know? and, and Chris worked, worked with us on that. So we've gotten three or four people on. We've lost one or two of them and they, they've moved on. But in hind, you know, so I felt like we, we've added a lot. But now, you know, I was thinking the same thing. Well, wait, we still look like we're a little shy of what we need. So now is the time to, to do that and, and figure out, uh, is it an entry level? Is it level two, level three? What do they have? We've got the IT person that we couldn't get for a while. We tried to fill that. So we were filling around it with, uh, you know, I think an audit three position. So as they came open, so uh, absolutely, we'll, we will keep looking at it, so. Yes. Um, thank you. I mean, we, so our audit plan is based on the resources that I have right now. Um, we may be able to expand that once we do get um, a candidate on board um, with our vacancy field. But I, I did this um, as of the, uh, the resources I have as of today, um, in case for some reason we don't get that vacancy filled, we don't get behind schedule. Um, the next audit we have on our list would be the Sheriff's Office Network Security Audit. So that kind of continues um, the VPN security side into the Sheriff's Office. Um, the sixth one, this is one we haven't had on our list before. Um, I talked to um, Ted and kind of ran this past Ted and ran it past Jim. 
do we want to put in some time for quote unquote unscheduled projects? Um, this would be able to give us time to deal with emerging risks if we have an audit that we need to do out of the hotline um, or do I, I literally unscheduled audits where we don't send out the engagement memo super big in advance. We literally go in that day, look at a certain area, check to make sure the controls are in place and working and then get out. Um, so, you know, kind of a pop in, you know, surprise, I guess, surprise audits in that we're not going to, you know, have all this lead time of, hey, we're going to, there might be an area that we recognize that comes up in the hotline or something that we want to go pop in and look and audit the controls and then if it's inventory or got a, ca a cash register. If somebody says they think somebody's still in cash, we could just go do a quick audit and see if it's done and we can get in and out without having all the, uh, the fanfare of the engagement memo and the announcing it. And we can get a better picture right. of if there's actual fraud going on there and potentially what the actual process really looks like. Um, so we've scheduled in um, some days um, for that to give us some leeway. And if we don't fill this, if we get to a point and we've completed these other projects, we do have other projects that just didn't make it to the plan that we would fill it with. So it's not like we're not gonna do anything. If we don't use these days, we'll fill it with a new audit um, that we have um, on our list to do. Um, the other uh, time that we, we've been doing control risk evaluations this year, um, I scaled those back a little bit because I wanted to focus on a second part of, okay, it's, it's related to controls, but it's, it's not quite the evaluation piece of it. Um, from the control evaluation piece, we, would, we have miscellaneous account, school surplus, and then um, the electronic check process for Knox County. When we went into COVID, they had to change a few things. Um, and then we thought this would just be a quick and easy, just look at their controls in place that changed for the electronic check request process, um, just to give some assurance of that those changes are, are working effectively. Um, so the other piece that we would normally assign to the controls risk evaluation, um, we've, we, we've kind of looked at it from a proactive approach. Um, we want to do some countywide training on green book and internal controls to go to, um, to audit committee, to, to Knox County Finance, to schools finance, sheriff's finance, all the finance departments and really train on what these controls are um, finance relies on the individual departments often to do the work, but if they don't have a good understanding of controls and what it means, it might be harder for them to grasp the roll up into why we need these controls. Um, and so um, it would also give, you know, it would, it would shift the focus of just kind of operating solely outside and your department to, oh, this is why we need it. It's a countywide initiative. This is an important thing and here's why and to explain why those controls and the control environment um, is so important. Um, why we have controls. It's not because we don't trust our employees. It's because we want the process done a certain way. And if we document it and identify our controls, then we have a better grasp of the, if we're going to achieve our outcome. Um, and so we have um, kind of 60 days to do this training on staff days to do this training, to put together training and to um, engage with the different departments and give some insight. We are going to be using this green book as our criteria for audits. We want to make sure that the people we're going to be auditing and holding to this standard understand it. Um, and we think the best way to do that is to kind of do this training on what we expect um, ahead of time. And then we, I've talked to Chris and Perry um, already, um, and we've agreed that we can to do a, an, an AP fraud training in finance um, to kind of show what are the issues that we continually see in audits? Where are the red flags and what are, um, what are we looking for? What are the documentation issues? Why are these things important to us? Um, and go through with their staff. And I'd like to do that with the schools um, and sheriffs and, and the elected officials, AP staffs as well. So they can, they can have, they're our first line of defense against fraud and them knowing and understanding the red flags that audit would be looking for will make it um, that much more um, efficient for them to do it and then hopefully would catch some of the things that we'll be, we would be seeing in an audit. 
Um, and then I did, we, I never have added hotline, on, but that's a, that's a resource that, that is a resource drain. So I put it on our resource list this year. Um, nor I, I normally do it, but because um, the audit staff is, is doing audits. So I try to take the hotline, but I added it this year because I included myself in this um, resource plan this year um, because it is something that takes our time and something we, we think is important. And I don't want to get it lost in the other things. I want to make sure it has a home on our audit plan. Um, so that's what we have proposed for 2021. So, and we are welcome to feedback. This is, um, I didn't put it on there. I probably should put it on there. This is our proposed audit plan. If we get an emergency, if we, there's a risk, if there's something that comes up, um, we will, of course, talk to audit committee, but this may change depending on what comes up throughout the year. This is our look as of now, um, but we don't want to ever um, just be tied into this because we have it on our plan. If something else comes more important um, that we as an audit department and, and the audit committee agree upon, then we want to be, we would replace a project with that on here, if that makes sense. Um, I've kind of covered the next thing on our thing was the internal controls initiative discussion. I think I've kind of covered it. Jim, did I miss anything? Do you, do you... Uh, you, you've covered it. I've got a different view of it, but it's not important right now for this meeting. Uh, uh, Perry and I've talked about it. Uh, the schools as well as Knox, uh, the Knox County Finance, they've done a good job on, they have in con internal control model manuals. Now, and, and I think they probably take care of a lot of the areas we're going to be concerned with, but at the same time, we'll make sure it's still tying in with the green book approach because those were, they, they didn't have much time to do those. All of a sudden the state came out and said, you got to have a June 30th of 2016. So they, they did a great job getting them done. Now we just got to sort of now look into the green book aspect of it and then see where we go from there. So uh, you're fine on that. Uh, okay. Um, our status report, I, find it. Um, but I, th I don't think there's anything we haven't covered. We've completed the trustee's office audit. Um, we completed the CRE for the Knox County School Nutrition, um, which is on the CRE summary. Um, we have the payroll and VPN audits in place. We have an a open position um, and we submitted our audit plan. So that covers our um, summary. Um, the CRE summary, we looked at the school's nutrition. Um, we, I think it covered 28 controls and we found three gaps in it, which we made recommendations. The gaps related to um, improvement of review of POs um, and process documentation, basically. So we've made recommendations for them to, to improve that. Um, I, I sent the recommendation summary. We don't, um, the travel audit recommendations were due, I think, Friday, I believe. Um, we closed a lot of them. Some of them are open with a revised date, and a lot of that has to do with the changes and and pause on travel that finance had. And they had, they didn't, like, we issued this in January and March, COVID hit, nobody was traveling, it wasn't a priority. Um, and they have now, uh, we revised most of the dates to April for them to uh, complete those travel recommendations. So then the travel recommendation summary, those are in there with the open revised dates. Um, and then the last thing that I sent to you all was something that Commissioner Jay requested, which was the um, kind of an overview of internal audit versus external audit. So Ted provided the external audit piece and, um, and then I kind of did an internal audit piece. I report functionally to you all, the audit committee. So I wanted to make sure you had a good understanding of our, what our work flows and how it comes from. Um, I sent those to y'all. Do you want me to go over those or just if you have any questions? I know we're already over on time. So I, I, I think they're self-explanatory. I was going to point them out because it, it, it may have gotten overlooked in everything you sent out, but that those two items were in what you distributed in. Uh, Commissioner Jay had asked for a flow chart, you know, sort of ha a site map, how, how these things roll into each other, particularly at finance, internal audit, external audit. And so I, I think y'all have done a pretty good job there that if there's something else we can address after that, we'll do that. Yeah. 
And uh, I, there's a couple other, there's one other thing, Commissioner Jay, you asked for uh, at, um, at the end, near the end of the meeting and it had to do with the executive session. Um, I'll, I'll resend that. It was part of what I had talked about and included on the website uh, last month when, or last meeting when I was describing how the audit committee was set up and everything. But one of them was the state requirement that allows for uh, non-executive uh, sessions for the audit group by the audit committee. And, and I'll send you that. It, it's, it's, it's short and sweet, but it has the conditions under which you can do it. And uh, it's, it's a tool that would be great for us to make use of. Uh, we didn't even know about it for a few years. So uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come in handy. But again, it's straight from the state. And it's not anything that's been incorporated into anything we've got. We've just been using that. And, 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 and uh, Law Director Book's been uh, on board with us ever since we started realizing we could use this and, and also has some ideas of how we, we, we work this out. So. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything else we owe to, but those were some of the things from the last meeting. So, uh, all right, Andrea, thanks for everything y'all done. You, you've done a lot of work, and I know, I know it's a lot of detail too. So, I, but I, I really appreciate it. And and and, and Ed Shouse, I really appreciate uh, your all's help during all that audit and everything. And uh, it, it, we we've got a lot out of it. So, onward and upward to the next group of folks we'll be working with, but. Um, I, only other things, there's nothing else really left on here on the agenda. There's other business, which I don't have any right now. If anybody has anything to bring up, um, uh, item 11, uh, potential audit meetings, uh, commissioner Jay, if we want to get together on, uh, the one for the, uh, CAFR report, and then I'll maybe send you what I'm thinking of some of the dates for the other ones. And do we want to merge them or not? So I'll get you something on that to look at. And then. Uh, we always do item 12, whatever number it is, is that is, is executive session because since it has to be on the, uh, to go into executive session, you have to put it on your agenda. And if you needed to, you could put out, we're having a special meeting and the only thing on there is you're going into executive session and you have to give them a generalization as to what, you know, what the reason is. And then there's a lot of other, you know, conditions about it, but uh, I, I see no reason to do that today. Plus I couldn't figure out how we could do that virtually, you know. Because you know, you're supposed to clear the room of everybody, you know, and no, no uh, you're exempt from uh, uh, sunshine. You, there's going to be no recordings, no minutes taken, anything like that. You can't make decisions either, but you can get a lot of information going. So with that, is there anything else anybody has thoughts, questions, comments on? We've worn you down good. Um, with that, let's, let, let's consider the meeting adjourned. And I don't have my hand with me, so... We're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, guys.